All right, here's a sort of a standard exercise type where what we do is we take a theorem and we say, okay, well, we have these conditions and if these conditions are true, then this other thing is true. But then you want to see, are all of those conditions absolutely necessary? And so in this case, we for theorem 2.3-6, Okay, so let's just recall. Um, so theorem 2.36 says that if um, k sub alpha um, are compact, so if this is some collection of compact sets where alpha can run, alpha is just the index, and the indexing set could be anything. Um, it could be countable, it could be finite, it could be uncountable, um, be anything. So if we have some collection of compact sets, and if, um, so I'm going to write it in this way, the intersection of finitely many if you take any finite subset of k alphas and intersect them, the intersection will be non-zero. So this is whenever a is some indexing set which is finite. So you choose, so alpha could range over some set which is much larger than a, but um, if this particular situation holds where if you, if you um, restrict yourself to finitely many of these k alphas and you intersect them, you always get a non-empty intersection. So if, the, if this is true, then the intersection over all of the alphas of the k alphas is non-zero. Okay, so this is the actual statement of theorem 2.36 and um, so it's corollary. Um, is also referred to. It's corollary. I don't know if this should be capitalized, but whatever. It's corollary um, states that if here we have kn are compact. So now we are um, indexing these by kn, n equals 1, 2, 3, etc. So n belongs to the natural numbers. Um, so this is a particular uh, way of indexing kn. So in particular, this is a uh, countable collection of compact sets. So these are compact and they're nested. So k1 contains k2 and k2 will contain k3, etc., etc. Then the intersection from one to infinity of kn is not empty. So basically what's happening here, um, hmm, is the empty set considered a compact set? Because these kn should obviously be non-empty sets. Um, I'm, I'm not going to write that out, that's sort of like obvious, like if the kn's are empty then this is sort of, obviously you intersect the, the empty set with anything and you get the empty set. So this only really says anything interesting when um, the KNs are non-empty. But anyways, um, so this is a particular case of basically this theorem is true because you just apply theorem 2.36 to it because we have some collection of compact sets and any finite intersection is going to be non-empty because if you have a nested set like this and you take the intersection of... of bunch of the kn's, like say you take the intersection of kn1 through knj, then you choose the largest index, the largest ni, where i ranges from 1 to j, and that will be a subset of all of the other sets. And so when you take the intersection, you're just going to end up with that one set. Um, and with that set being one of the non-empty compact sets we're considering, the intersection is going to be non-empty. 
And so therefore, by theorem 2.36, the intersection of all the KNs is non-empty. So that's why this corollary is a direct result of the theorem. Um, so what we want to do is, so we want to state that, we want to prove that the theorem and the corollary are false when we replace compact by closed or bounded. So um, any counter example to the corollary is also one for the theorem. Because if you if you are able to prove that the if you are able to find a scenario where the corollary doesn't hold, then well the corollary is just a special case of the theorem, and so this is also an example of the theorem not holding. And so we're going to search for counterexamples um, for both uh, for both the theorem and the corollary. So we want to replace the word compact with closed and bounded. Of course, we're in R n. Um, here we're just going to consider examples in R because that's all you need, but this will hold true in general for Rn. Um, so we want to replace the word compact by closed or bounded because in Rn compact means both closed and bounded. So we want to see is that are both of these conditions necessary? Probably should have silenced my phone before recording like I always do. So there we go. All right, so let's start with um, closed. So I'm just going to write closed. So we want to assume, so we want a finite, We no, we want a countable collection of closed sets, which are nested, but which have empty intersection. So what we're going to do, we're, we're going to let kn be the closed interval from n to infinity. Then certainly um, kn plus 1 is going to be a subset of kn for all n because um, with kn plus 1 the left end point is n plus 1 which is further to the right than n. And so any point which is in kn plus 1 is going to be greater than or equal to n and thus will also be in kn. Okay. So certainly these are nested. Um, here, I'm actually gonna, just so that, yeah, I don't know, these, these are sort of nice because you can actually like look at what these look like. So if you start at zero, then you have um, K1 is going to be everything to the right of one. K2 is going to be everything to the right of two. K3 is going to be everything to the right of three, etc. K2, K3, etc. And so you can imagine, like, if you take the intersection of all of these, well, if you just keep going and going and going to the right, you're eventually going to get past everything. Um, so for any x in R, there is some n, some natural number large enough that it's greater than x. So x is then not going to be in kn, but remember, kn is a subset of the intersection from 1 to infinity of kn. Or, okay, so this should be the, I'll just write intersection from i equals 1 to infinity of ki because we're already using the variable n. So x is not in kn, and um, kn contains this intersection, and so x cannot be in this intersection either. And this holds for every single x in R, and thus no point in R can be in this intersection. So the intersection from 1 to infinity of ki is the empty set. Alright, so there we go. Um, and then we do sort of a similar idea for if we just consider bounded sets. Um, so, of course, like one of the ways that you want to think about these, so if you do closed and bounded, so if you are only assuming closed and you're not assuming bounded, you better be using unbounded sets, um, because if you weren't, then you'd have a, um, then the theorem would actually apply. 
So now if we just consider bounded sets, well, we're not assuming closedness, so these sets that we consider better not be closed. And indeed, we're going to let kn be the open interval from 0 to 1 over n. Um, then if we look at kn plus 1, this is going to be the open interval from 0 to 1 over k plus 1. And now 1 over k plus 1 is to the right, or to, no, 1 over k plus 1 is to the left of 1 over n. So this is contained in 0, 1 over n, which is kn for all n. And so again, if we want to draw this out, as I like to do, you're basically, so this is 0 and this is 1, and this is going to be k1, and then you have k2 goes up to 1 half. It's going to be everything this way. k3 will go up to 1 third. k4 will go up to a fourth, and then you'll just keep getting closer and closer and closer and closer. Um, so yeah, we can sort of see where this is going and why this, when we take this intersection, it should be empty. Um, so, for all n, um, and in fact, actually, let's, let's, do an, let's do an interesting thing. Let's actually define this like this. We're going to use closed brackets inside. I'm not going to redraw the picture with closed brackets, but there should be closed brackets there now. Okay, so, um, so we have these things in our intersection. Okay, so now we want to prove that any x and r is not going to be in the intersection of all of the kn's. So let's choose some x and kr. Um, if x is less than or equal to 0 or x is greater than or equal to 1, then certainly x is not going to be in k1, and so it can't be in the intersection of the ki's either because um, the intersection of the ki's is a subset of k1. Okay, so certainly none of these values are, but instead if x is in the open interval from 0 to 1, um, then there is some value n such that 1 over n is less than x, because the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is 0, and these are all positive numbers. So x then cannot be in the open, or the half open interval from 0 to 1 over n. And this is equal to kn, and that's of course contained in the intersection of the ki's. Thus, the intersection from 1 to infinity of ki is empty. So again, we have a counterexample here. Um, and so the main point here is that if you don't assume that your set is both closed and bounded, then there will be some sort of... You have some ability to escape when you take... Um, the intersection of these sets. Um, in the first case, you escape to infinity, and in the second case, you escape to zero. And actually, the reason that I um, uh, decided to choose these with the right, um, with these half open intervals, is so that you can sort of see that it's sort of like, I mean, of course, you can't like literally take one over zero to get infinity, or one over infinity to get zero. Um, although the latter one is typically more easy to define in terms of, or more, there's more situations where you can define that rigorously. Um, but in any case, the, 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 the point is that these two collections are set of sets are pretty similar. Um, and so they're actually, um, so you're the function one over x is continuous from the interval, from, it's continuous from the positive numbers to the positive numbers. Um, and so because of that, um, well, 
Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess the main idea is that like um, these sets that we're considering, they they sort of look similar, um, and I think that there is like a topological sense in which these things are um, definably um, similar or something like that. Um, but yeah, so basic, basically, because of the types of sets that we're using, um, the way that we approach infinity in the first collection of sets is very similar to how we approach zero in the second um, collection of sets. In both cases, you've got some point that you're not quite able to reach. Um, and so you're able to use that to escape um, and get an intersection which is empty. But yeah, so this is sort of interesting to think about. Um, thinking about the different properties that sets can have and sequences of sets can have. Um, but anyways, that's probably enough rambling uh, for now because we've finished the exercise. And so this shows us that we really do need these sets to be compact. Um, or else we have counterexamples to the corollary and thus we have counterexamples to the theorem, and so we're done.